Praise Jesus. Wana Sifiwe, would you want to say hello to me? Yes, thank you so much. Um, as Pastor has said, we began this journey and we have been busting the myth of age as far as God fulfilling his promises is concerned. And this was inspired by a guy who said in Joshua chapter 14, where we drive our theme of the year from, he said, I am as vigorous as I was 40 years ago when Moses sent me to spy the land, and I am as vigorous as I was to go into the battle. So today we are going to look at another guy who did not say those exact words, but exemplified the same spirit, because God used him at his old age to carry out one of his greatest missions in life, and that is Moses. And we are going to look at three things in the life of Moses his zeal, his preparation, and his purpose. And this someone I'm calling it, look and live. Tell your neighbor, look and live. That's all we need to do. Amen? So read with me uh, Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. Let's read together. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he had led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that the bush was on fire and it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Hittites, uh, the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. So we began in the first week when Pastor Isigia talked to us about Abraham. God comes to Abraham and said, I will bless you. I will make you, your name great. I will make you a father to many descendants. But in the same promise, he says that your children will be enslaved in a foreign land. But I will come and rescue them. So at 100 years, Abraham begets Isaac. Isaac begets Jacob. And Jacob begets their 12 sons. Among the sons is Joseph, who does not receive favor amongst his brothers. So they sell him to Egypt. But while he's in Egypt, God is with him. God is with Joseph. And he elevates him to the, to, uh, to the level of second in command from Pharaoh. He becomes like the prime minister of Egypt. Around the same time, after a long time, there is famine in Canaan. And Joseph invites his father and his brothers to take refuge in Egypt so that they can escape farming. And while they come to Egypt, the Bible says they increase in number and they become great. So after a long time, Pharaoh dies, Joseph died, and then come another Pharaoh who did not know anything about Joseph or what he had done. And the Bible says he became threatened by the children of Israel and how they were increasing and becoming great and he resolved to destroy them, okay? And as he resolved to destroy them, the Bible says, again, he decreed that all children be, uh, born 
to the Hebrew, the male children born to the Hebrew woman, women should be murdered. But how many know that you cannot destroy what God has promised? The more he resolved to destroy the seed of God, the people that God had blessed, the more they increased in number and they became great. And Moses is born around this time. And the Bible says his mother thought, ah, this child is really beautiful. I won't allow him to be killed. So what did he, she do? She hid him in a river. Put him in a basket, hid him in a river. In the same river, Pharaoh's daughter is coming to, it says that she was coming to take a shower. Is that true? To, to bathe in the river. They used to bathe in the river. That's, that's weird. So, so she's coming to bathe in the river. The same river that Moses is hidden. And she sees a basket floating. And she, she says to the servants, bring me the basket. And behold, in the basket is little boy Moses. And she says, I am going to take care of Moses. Long story short, Moses is adopted by the princess. And he grows up in Egypt. So when I was reading this story of Moses, I was reminded of a story of a, a lady and a um, a lady who feared God and an atheist. They were neighbors. So this lady, every morning she woke up and she used to pray loudly and tell God everything that she wants. So this particular morning, the atheist used to be so annoyed by this lady because he was thinking, how can you be praying to someone who doesn't exist? Why are you wasting your time? So he resolved, one day I'll teach you a lesson. So this lady woke up one morning, she's telling God, God, I need sugar, I need oil, I need groceries. So she's making a shopping list to God. And the atheist is listening. So he decides, I am going to buy everything that she wants. So he goes, he buys everything that the lady has said in the prayers. Then he comes and drops it at the doorstep. So this lady, as usual, wakes up in the morning and she starts praying loudly. Then she opens the door and lo and behold, Everything she had asked God is right there. And so she starts praising God. God, thank you that you have answered my prayer. And the atheist jumps out of the bushes and he said, Aha, I told you there is no God. I am the one who went and bought everything that is in your basket. And this lady starts praising God and saying, God, thank you that you have provided everything I needed and you have made the devil pay for it. <laughs> you know. So here's what I'm saying. When God wants to fulfill something in your life, he will use even your enemies to accomplish his purpose in your life. David said he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. That is our God. So he preserves Moses' life and he allows him to grow up in the palace because of the purpose that he has for him. And the Bible says that Moses grew up in and became mighty in speech and in deed. That is what Stephen says in the account of Moses in Acts chapter 7. He says that Moses grew in speech and in deed. I want to give you a little background of Egypt at that time. Egypt was a superpower, like the United States of our day, you know. It was great in every, every splendor of of majesty you would think of. And one of the historians writes and says, of the 10 portions of wisdom that were availed to the world, Egypt had nine. And one of the portion of wisdom was left for the rest of the inhabitants of the earth to share in. So Egypt was great, a superpower. And that is the environment that Moses grew up in. And he became mighty in speech and in deed. One of the historians write that Moses was educated in all wisdom of Egypt. In one time, he was a commander of an army of the Egyptians. And he led Egypt, um, he led Egypt, against the, uh, he led Egypt into a battle against the Ethiopians and won. So Moses grew up well. Tell your neighbor when God's hand is on your life, he will make things happen for you. Because he has a purpose and a reason for your life. You don't have to worry about the oppositions and all these things. God has a, has, has a purpose 
for your life, he will make things work out for you. So at 40 years of age, we are told that Moses was walking around and he saw an Egyptian oppressing an Israeli. And he was angry. Now I want to think that Moses discovered his calling when he was 40 years old. Because when he's walking, it, it doesn't say anything about Moses' life from the time he's taken by the princess to the time he's 40 years old. We don't know. So the Bible doesn't say so much about Moses. But I'm thinking when he's walking around and sees this thing, that something awakens through him. And he tells himself, I have to arise and do something about it. You know, when you know that there is something you can do about a situation, and you arise, and you do it, and you're waiting for people to applaud you, for people to appreciate you, but they don't. That very thing that Moses does becomes a tragedy in his life. And he's cast out into the desert. And the Bible says for 40 years, he was in the desert. Can you imagine? Something, one thing happens in your life. And it changes the trajectory of your life forever. You know? You're 40 years. You don't want something bad to happen to you at 40 years, right? It should happen maybe earlier because you have the, the, the blessing of time to change that tragedy. But if it happens when you're older, it is bad. When you lose at your job at 40 years, you're thinking, now, how do I go back to the market and start looking for another job? When your marriage gets destroyed, when your children are out and, and gone into the university, you're thinking, will I go back and start dating again? You know, things may happen in our lives that force, forces us to go into the desert. And I'm saying this, for Moses, he did something good. He was a deliverer. That was his calling. And when I say calling, I'm not meaning just the religious vocation. You understand? I'm saying that thing that you know from deep within your heart you are born to do. That thing that pushes you and you're very passionate about it. And you know, why are people not seeing that God called me to do this thing? Why are they not celebrate? You get a job, you go into that office and you know for sure the systems and the changes that you need to effect. And your boss does not see it. And you're thinking, what's wrong with these people? And something happened. And instead of Moses being applauded and commended, he now has to run away into the desert where he remains 40 years later. And in the desert, the desert is not a happy place. It is a difficult place. In fact, we are told when he gave birth to his firstborn son, he called him Gashom, meaning I have, become a foreign, uh, I have become a stranger in a foreign land. He was, trying to he was trying to show that this is not a happy place. It is hard. It is difficult. And many of us are in the place of desert. I don't know how you got in that place. Maybe the reason why you are in the desert is because of your own mistakes, the consequences of your choices. Or somebody orchestrated things in your life and now you find yourself in this particular place where it's difficult and hard and you're wondering, where is God? What is going on in my life? Has the purpose of God stopped in my life? You're in a difficult place. You see, 40 years later, Moses, who was mighty in deed and in speech, became humble reluctant to do God's will, intimidated, because time had changed him. Time had humbled him. And I was telling people in the first service, you know, when you're 20 years old, let me, let me use the, the girls in the, in the house today. When you're 20 years old, you actually can actually think that you will marry a prince. Cindy, you have dreams. I saw this meme <laughs> on Facebook one time. A girl... A girl at his 20s, she writes a list of the things that she wants in a guy. I want him tall, dark, and handsome. I want him successful, rich, driving a Mercedes, you know? She has a list. At 30, the list changes a little bit. She, she wants him, well, 
forget about tall, dark, and handsome. I can do with anyone. But at least let him be successful, saved, all those things. At 50, she wants him alive and breathing. <laughs> That's all I'm going to deal with. You know, time has a way of humbling everybody and dealing with everything that you placed your confidence in. It is not hard to imagine why Moses was reluctant to go back to Egypt, the very place at 40 years old, he was eager to do exploits for God. What changed? The desert has a way of humbling everybody and changing you and making you know that your confidence and those come from how you look, what you have, where you are. God wanted him in the desert not to destroy Moses, but to prepare him to become the vessel that he wants to use. So listen to me. It doesn't matter why you are in the desert. Maybe you are in the desert because of something that you did. And when I was preparing this message, I told first service, there was something very heavy in my heart about somebody who got a child out of wedlock. And since then, your life has taken a different trajectory. You have, you have like sort of given up to the dreams and the hopes that you had because of this particular thing that happened. And God is saying, although you were cast out in the desert, the hardest place of your life, you are not cast out of God's presence. And his plans for you haven't changed. Yes, they have been halted by the desert, but they haven't changed. God is still on course to fulfill that which he designed for you to do. That is what he's saying in, in Moses' life. 80 years old, he would have thought, God has already moved on. That was not my calling. Probably I didn't hear God clearly. Probably I made a mistake. This is my life. I'm 80 years old. What more can change? Listen, age is just a number. Not a factor when God wants to do something. Because God is wanting this 80-year-old grandfather to be the one to carry out his mission back in Egypt. The desert has rid Moses of every confidence, every wisdom that he had gathered in Egypt. Now he cannot use any of those privileges. It is just him and God. Praise the name of Jesus. And the Bible says, while he was in the desert, Moses noticed a burning bush. And this is what it says. That, in verse, let's go to verse 4. It says, uh, verse, verse 2. Let's start from verse 2. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in flame, flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that the bush, that though the bush was on, was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight why the bush does not burn up. So this bush is burning. And we know that it is the angel of the Lord who is trying to capture Moses' attention. This blesses me because it means that Moses' curiosity had not been killed in the desert. He was still looking out because burning, stuff burning in the, in the desert was not something unfamiliar. There was many occurrences of burning bush in the desert. But Moses takes note that this bush is different from all the other bushes that I have seen. There is something different about it. Now, you know, success of you discovering what God wants to do in your life is in how well you can discover and discern the move of God in your life. So even if you are cast out in the hardest place of your life, let your spirit stay awakened to God because you know this for sure, that although you cannot see him at work, God is always at work and he will always be calling you out because the desert was not meant to kill you or destroy you. It is to prepare you. And when God knows that you are ready, God knows that you, you are ready now to arise and do that which he has purposed for you. 
he will capture your attention. So the question is, are you looking out for God in your desert place? Is your spirit awakened to the move of God? Can you discern the move of God in your life, even while you're going through situations and storms in your desert place? Or is your spirit, has your spirit been bowed down? Has your spirit been killed? Such that even when God is moving, you have no idea. Moses' spirit was alert. So when he saw the burning bush, he said, I will go over and look. Tell your neighbor, look and live. Do not be focused on the time lost. Don't focus yourself on the situations as they are. Focus on God who is on the move. Jesus said, I am always at, in the lookout to see where God is at work so that I can join him there. God is at work, people, even in our desert situations. The question is, are we looking? Are we focused on God or the situations around us? See what he says, that when God saw, this is good. So, verse 4, he says, when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called him from within the bush. When God sees that now you have his attention, hey, he is ready to say, behold. When God sees that you are alert to his move and you can discern his move, he is ready to act. Because many times we are saying we are waiting on the Lord and God is waiting for us to see him moving in our situation so that we can join him in what he is doing. Are you looking? Because when God saw that Moses had turned, maybe turned from the disappointment of his life, maybe turned from his bitterness, maybe turned from the unforgiveness, maybe turned from the frustration, when he saw that he had now turned to the burning bush, and the burning bush represents the presence of God, God was ready to send him on his mission. That's what we need. We need people who are awakened in their spirit. Not people who are bowed down by situations of life. And they miss out on the move of God. Because God is always at work. So God says to him, Moses, Moses, take off your shoes. Because the place you're standing is holy, holy ground. God is getting ready to send Moses out to carry out his purposes. Now, this tradition of removing one's shoe was a tradition that was practiced by the communities um, of, of that time, the ancient Near East communities. Yeah? So whenever they wanted to do a transaction, the removing of one shoe was like a tradition to legalize the kind of thing that is happening between the two parties. And I was reminded of the story of Boaz and Ruth. When the king's man redeemer said, you re he told Boaz, you redeem, you redeem her. He removed his shoes. Boaz told him, remove your shoes and give it to me to symbolize that you have given up your rights to me to redeem the land, the property of Naomi and Ruth. So he removed his shoes to make that transaction complete. On one level, God is telling Moses, remove your shoes because you're standing on a holy ground. When I invite you in my house, you probably leave your shoes at the door, right? So that you don't dirtify my carpet. But I don't think God is concerned about his carpet at this time. When he's telling Moses, remove your shoes, God can create another carpet any time. What he's telling Moses, I want you to hand over your rights to me. I want you to surrender to me so that I may use you the way I want. Not the way you wanted to be used 40 years ago when you went to kill people so that you can do what I had created you to do. No, I want you to do it my way. Hand over your rights. Surrender your rights. Submit your rights. And that is what we need. That's what we need when God wants to do 
things in our lives, we need to surrender. We need to submit. We need to say it is your will, not my will. You know, zeal is good. Because at the onset, zeal is what drives you to do the will of God, isn't it? But when zeal overrides the purpose of God, it becomes destructive. That is what happens in Moses' life. He was eager to do something for God that he did not consider the time, the seasons, and the plan and the purpose that God had. So he did something right, but then he did it in the wrong time. And some of us, maybe because of the pressure of age, we want to do things, isn't it? We want to leave a legacy. We want to fulfill our dreams. And many times when we run ahead of God and disregard the times and the season of God when he's at work, we will end up in the desert. So God is telling Moses, submit to me. Remove your shoes. We will do this my way. Not with armies and chariots, but my, with the word of God. That says the Lord, 80 years old, God is not telling him, I'll give you chariots and armies to make you feel very confident. God is telling him, I will only give you my word. You will go back to Egypt and say, that says the Lord. And listen to a beautiful thing. By the end of Moses' life, we really do not consider how old he was. We only remember the great things that he did. That is all what matters because age is just a number. You will be what God has promised you to be. Don't worry about the time and the seasons and the age and the gap. Just focus on the Lord. Let your zeal be submitted to God. Do it God's way. Some of you are afraid to go back to school because you went four years to school. You studied something that you think is not useful to you right now. And you think, I can't go back to school again. If that is what God desires, go back. No time is lost. Some of you are thinking, I, now I think I will give up this thing called marriage. Abana, if there is somewhere in the calendar of God that you are to be married, please do not keep your, yourself out of God's blessing because of the age factor. That is not something that God considers when he wants to fulfill his purposes in your life. Praise the name of Jesus. Age is just a number and Moses is a good example that God will do it his own way, his own time, by his own means. The only thing you need to do is look up. Look to him. Not on the time lost, not to the age, but to him. Praise the name of Jesus. Allow me to invite the senior pastor to conclude for us. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Tabitha. She was called to preach 